Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. I didn't have to tell you that I was a third grade teacher. <laughs> anyway, I'm Donna Maxey. I'm founder and director of Race Talks, and we are going to start with our newcomer um, introduction. How many of you, this is your first time here? Great. And you even raised your hand, and I didn't have to ask. Thank you. See, third grade teacher just signaled you automatically went to your thing. Okay, so being a third grade teacher, here's what's the important room. Out the back door, straight across is the women's restroom. Out this door, straight across is the men's restroom. So those are the two important rooms besides this one. So we're gonna do the newcomer um, introduction and then we'll get started, thank you. I'm Donna Maxey. I am the founder director of Race Talks, and we're really excited to see you here. I just wanted to do quite, kind of an introduction about what Race Talks is about. We're doing this for newcomers. We're excited that you're here. Race Talks was started out of um, when I was asked to speak at a McMenamin's History Pub, and the topic was urban renewal, urban removal. Anyway, in your brochure here, we have several things. You might want to take your brochure and look at it. Be flexible and fluid about the schedule. It does change. There's also the Jefferson High School. Um, we have race talks the first week of the month at Jefferson High School. And if you're interested in being a part of a dialogue group, you can fill this out and leave this form. There should be a brown envelope on your table. Tear this off and leave it in the envelope and we will get in touch with you about dialogue groups. We're working on those right now. If you turn to the other side of the brochure, there is, um, we have rules. We have the race talks ground rules. And um, we really try to encourage people to follow these rules. And they're important that people feel safe being here. I've had people of color who have said, this is the first time I've ever told a white person how I really feel. And I've had white people who have said, this is the first time that I was able to talk about race and not worry about putting my foot in my mouth. I feel safe to talk, I feel safe that I will be accepted and I won't be beat up for, for saying or asking what seems like an obvious and stupid question. So that's really important. So what we encourage people to do is to listen to each other with curiosity, respect differences, Agree to disagree. You don't have to agree with everything somebody says. You can agree that that's their opinion. I don't agree with Rush Limbaugh, but he has a right to speak his opinion. Speak from the self and, not, and, and from the heart. It means when you're speaking, don't talk about, I know somebody who, either it's you and you were involved with the person, or you know, speak from your own experience, not someone else's. Respect confidentiality. Now, because you're involved in these discussions, you have a right to go out and share the discussion that happened at your table. But what we're asking you to do is if you do share something that someone else has said, to not give their name, to not give their location. Contribute honestly and positively. That's all we can ask anybody to do. And assume positive intent. Even if somebody says something and you, and you feel like you want to roll your eyes and say, how could you be so stupid? Assume that they, they really had best intentions when they, did, when they said what they said. Be open to new ideas and relax and enjoy. Uh, one of the reasons that we have, have it here at McMinimins so that we can have food and drink. When I was thinking about how to put this together, the thing that I thought about was, wow, we need to have some place where people can drink and have food because it's hard to be contentious over food, to get indigestion. So we want, hey, you guys, laugh. Ooh, this is exciting. So, so we want you to relax. Uh, McMinimins is our sponsor, and uh, we want to make sure that they are seeing some results with their cash register, too. So just eat and drink yourself. Follow-up activities, uh, just for fun. Those, the follow-up activities, these are the things that we're trying to get people to do. One of the things that folks do a lot of times is they'll go to a lecture and they'll feel so good about the lecture and then they go home and do the same things they've always done. And what we want folks to do is something different. Don't go home to your community where you don't know people of color or you don't know white people. 
go home and get to you know get to know the people who are at your table. We have little cards, little colored cards at the table for those folks who say, well, I don't have a business card. So give people your number. Get together. Have coffee. And it says, go out for, uh, just for fun, go out and make friends with a person in your own ethnic group. I moved to an area in Portland that I had taught in, and there were kids of color, lots of kids of color at my school. So I just assumed there would be lots of people in the neighborhood who were of color, and boy, was I wrong. And the folks who were there were not very friendly. Everybody was white. They weren't very friendly. And I thought, gosh, these people aren't very friendly at all. So, of course, in my usual manner, after I'd been there a year, I got a couple of the neighbors that were friendly to help me throw one of those uh, block parties. So we threw one of those. We passed out flyers four blocks wide, ten blocks long. And about 50 people came. And what amazed me is that some of those people had lived in that neighborhood for 28 years and didn't know each other. So what I'm inviting people to do is go make friends with someone in your own ethnic group. Let me ask a question. How many of you know the people on your block, three houses to your left, the three houses to your right, and three in front of you. Now, if you know nine houses, and when I say no, meaning you know them, you've been in their house, you got their phone number, how many people know that? Look around the room. Go make friends with somebody in your neighborhood, okay? <laughs> we got one person. Let's hear it for Susie. Let's hear it for Susie. Susie does. How long have you lived there, Susie? 30 years, and I bet you some, there's some other people here who've lived in their home 30 years and don't know folks either. This is part of the thing. I remember when we were kids, you know, your parents never worried about you. We didn't have to come in until it was dark because we, wherever we were, we were with people we knew. So get to know your neighbors. Talk to the people who are around you. And when you do, don't discuss race. If, you, if it's a person of color or if you're person of color, it's a white person, don't talk about race, just talk about what you have in common, you know? Things like, gee, that's a nice shirt you have on, or you just never know what, where it's going to lead in a discussion. You never know what you'll find out from people when you talk to them. You might develop a relationship from it. So, um, and the question is, how many people of color, if you are white, and how many white people and people of other ethnicities are on your speed dial? Now, what I call speed dial is those are your people that you call up and say, hey, I just got a promotion, let's go have a drink. Hey, me and the boyfriend broke up, need to talk. You know, those people you call at three o'clock in the morning. You say, who can I call and talk to? How many people from different ethnic groups are on your speed dial? And if they're not, the question is, why not? There are a couple of premises that we have here at Race Talks, and there's a great book that I'd love for you to read. It's called Courageous Conversations in Race. It is a part of the foundation that I used in helping to put together Race Talks. And one of the things that they talk about in Courageous Conversations in Race is that we make the assumption, we do talk about race and white is a race, and we make the assumption that white people have privilege. And a lot of white people would say, I don't have privilege, I work my butt off. Well, yes, you do work your butt off. But what you don't know is that people of color work harder, and they have to. And, um, and to help you kind of understand that, think of yourself as a fish. You wouldn't ask a fish, how's the water? Fish don't even know they're in water. Just like white people don't know that they have privilege. But I'm a fish too. But somebody threw me on the dock. And every so often I get to jump in the water when I get a degree or I get a promotion or something great happens. I get to jump in the water and I'm like, wow, is this what it feels like? This is great, I'm loving this. And then next thing I know somebody snatches me out and throws me back up on the dock and I'm up there gasping for air. So it's not that people, white people don't work hard because they do. And one of the things that um, really happens is that I think of life as being like a 100 meter race and poor white people start at zero at the starting line all the way up to the Rothschilds who start at 97. Those are the people who sold arms during World War II to both sides. 
to the Axis and the Allies, so they were making theirs no matter who. So people have different levels of privilege that they get to exercise. People of color start back behind that starting line. Back to African Americans who are back at minus 50, and you say, why, why African Americans back at minus 50? Well, we're back at minus 50 because we're the most maligned group here in the, in the United States. And if you stop and think about it, I mean, think about it. So anyway, and when we're back there, we're blindfolded, one leg tied behind us carrying a piano. And the gun goes off. And we wind up either slightly behind, even, or slightly ahead. And the question is, how do you manage to do that when you've started so far behind? And it's because you know you have to work harder. And I, sometime I'm gonna make a film of this because I did this with my kids in my classroom. And it was the most amazing thing I've ever seen that it came out just like what I'm sharing with you. So sit back, relax, enjoy, and uh, we, will t we will have a wonderful discussion afterwards. Thank you all for coming and we're really excited that you're here. All right. Thank you. Um, very quickly, next month is the upcoming Race Talks program is Women of Color in the Workplace. And um, it's going to be about experienced women in the workplace. So um, there's a possibility that we'll have a series of three of these. I'm not sure at this point. Um, and the other two will be someplace other than here at Race Talks. But anyway. Welcome, glad you're here. And we're gonna jump right into uh, the evening. And before we start, um, I want you to go with me. I want you to trust me to take you, I'm going to give, take you on a guided daydream. How many have ever done a guided daydream before? A few of you have, okay. So in order to, to, be, to do a guided daydream, you're gonna just sit and relax, close your eyes, and get into what my voice is telling you. I'm, I'm not going to do anything crazy. Um, I'm not going to send anybody around to steal your money. Although that's a thought. Hmm. That was a joke, y'all. Please laugh. I laugh. So, um, anyway, so I want you to get in a comfortable position, close your eyes, and what we're going, I'm going to kind of put you in a, a mindset to help you understand this evening. So, this is my, this is my life, this is my daydream. And uh, so close your eyes, relax. I'll give you a nice voice. How's that? Okay. So, we're going back to when I was 10 years old, and I lived in this big, beautiful house on Borthwick between Knott and Graham, and it was a double lot, and it was lined with boxwood shrubbery all the way around and laurel bushes on one side and when you and then in the front on the grass strip which was manicured within an inch of its life was a row of pine trees and as you enter in to the walkway there were two azalea bushes inside of the boxwood shrubbery and then there were two giant nut trees and this whole yard was nothing but beautiful plants, flowers all in the flower beds, and a rose garden in the back. There was a long, two long driveways on either side that went back to three, two three-car garages. There were three peach trees, one particular that I used to dream about, that the peach was the size of my head and nobody could eat it but me. And there were two plum trees and beautiful green grass and rhododendrons and a blue spruce and just wonderful and then an arbor that hung outside of the sun porch and outside and then once you went into the house um, there were hardwood floors and sunken doors built-in china closets china cabinets rather um, picture rails a rail for a plate rail in the dining room. There was a servant's quarters, kind of a butler's pantry for, for the servant to, 
to stay in. There was this like the uh, swinging door between the dining room and the kitchen that we knocked off the hinges when my parents weren't at home and pretended that it fell off. There was, a, it was a time of an idyllic childhood. It was a time when people didn't have to lock their car doors. And there were starter buttons to start your car. But you didn't lock your doors because nobody was stealing. There were all kinds of, you'd go to bed at night, everybody had a dog. All the dogs were friends. We're, our dog was Cisco, next door was Poncho, Mr. County's dog. You knew, we knew all the people for blocks and blocks and blocks. We knew everybody. By first name, by everybody was Mr. So-and-so and Mrs. So-and-so. -and -so. so we knew all of these people. And it was such a wonderful time. You'd leave your skates out at night, you'd leave your bicycle out at night, and you'd get up in the morning, and the only thing that had happened to it is that maybe it rained on it. But it was still there. Because everybody knew everybody, and they weren't going to steal from each other. And then when I was in sixth grade, my folks got a mom pop in the kids' grocery store, and I couldn't understand why they got that grocery store. And I started hearing stories about we were going to lose our house, that it wasn't going to be there anymore. And it's like, how can you take away this house that we grew up in that was such a wonderful life? And every year we kept hearing more and more till the time I was 12 years old in eighth grade, um, we were the last ones in the neighborhood. Every day, I didn't go to my neighborhood school anymore. I went to the school that was up by the grocery store that my parents purchased. And every night we would come home and ride through the neighborhood and see who was missing, what family had gone. And we would go and tell people goodbye, and we'd cry and hug, and okay, we'll stay in touch, we'll stay in touch. And some of those people I have not seen to this day. That was over 55 years ago. So I don't know what happened to those people. Some of them left town. When you go up, not go up Russell, there were all the businesses. There was Mr. Hardy's shoe shop. There was Eager Beaver's record store. There was Citizens, um, where now the Urban League is. There was Citizens Fountain, where you could go have a real soda and sit in the booths and listen to records at your own jukebox at the table. And if we didn't go to Citizens, and if we turned to the right and go down past Broadway to Widler, there was Daddy's Barbershop him with the other three barbers, and all the people who came in who were my friends, who I'd known since I was a small child. And it was a wonderful time. And we could go a few blocks from there and go down to our church, which was a beautiful old church that had a full basement and a balcony and stained glass windows and a big organ and all these wonderful things that happened. And then all of a sudden, the neighborhood shut down. People had to move out. They're no longer were the friends. Daddy had to close up his barber shop. Mr. Hardy and the other people who had shops on Williams, their stores were closed up and the windows were boarded up. So they no longer were there. And it became a ghost town. We lost not only our home, and Daddy lost his business, but we lost our church and we lost our community. And for almost 10 years, at least five, those buildings on Williams sat empty, boarded up, and the neighborhood was falling apart, where it had been a vibrant community prior to that. So, this is the community that was left. This is what happened to people's homes. And some of the people who got moved out of their homes 
got moved six or seven times. Some of the African American people who lived in those homes were moved six or seven times to redistribute the community. I don't know if you know, but the black community actually started over where the bus depot is and was moved and moved and moved and moved. And now it's been moved again to Gresham. So I appreciate that this project has happened. I appreciate that Kayin and Cleo have put their life's blood into making this happen. But the question is, what more do you want? When does it get to be enough? When does it stop? Because it's no longer a guided daydream. Now it's a nightmare. So I want you to open your eyes now. Welcome back. I should be screaming and hollering and running through the aisles now. But, you know, the day that we had to move, we drove through the neighborhood and we cried. We cried because we lost our lives. We lost our community. We lost the people who loved us. And now they're getting ready to build a building on a lot that's been vacant over 50 years. And they're going to build a tribute to the black community, which is no longer there. There is one black business on Williams Avenue now. And every time I ride up Williams Avenue, I'm not going to say what I say because it's not nice. So sit back, listen to our panel, and be prepared for an interesting time. Thank you. My name is Thomas. <clears throat> I'm a historian, and uh, I'm going to do an illustrated lecture to give you some deep background about the history of the Williams Avenue area. And here is, please go back. Here on this slide, this is an aerial view that shows Williams Avenue on the right. That's the street going straight down on the right. That is a direct feeding arterial onto the steel bridge. This was the Black Broadway. It was the principal street in the, in the black neighborhood. None of you will ever see this. It belongs solely to the people who are over 65 who can remember seeing it back in the day. Almost the entire black business district, all the jazz clubs were all clustered in that immediate area. Jazz. Next slide. So here is Duke Ellington on Williams Avenue. He's at McClendon's Rhythm Room. And he, uh, he is having his 54th birthday. Now, Duke Ellington wasn't playing there. He had a sold out show at McElroy's Ballroom downtown. But he went here. Because that's what he knew. He is with uh, Columbia Records staff and some of his local fans. That was at 1500 North Williams Avenue. Okay, we can go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> the Williams Avenue neighborhood didn't start out as a black neighborhood. Like all Portland neighborhoods, it started out as farmland. 
And what you see here is an original farmhouse that's located on Clackamas Street at the corner of Crosby, I should say, was located there. It's now about where the front door of the Boda Center is. It was a couple of blocks off Williams. It was built perhaps in the 1870s before water and sewer connections were available in East Portland. The structure you see behind it is a water tower that was powered by a windmill pump. How did this become a black neighborhood? Well, most train porters were black and Union Station was a short walk across the steel bridge. Things got better when they built a Broadway bridge in 1913. By the end of World War I, blacks were a substantial part of the neighborhood's population. In 1919, the Portland Realty Board wrote new regulations that formalized segregation in Portland. The Realtor's Covenant prohibited selling or renting property outside of designated neighborhoods to what they called Negroes or Orientals. This was later amended to include Jews. What the federal government referred to as the Williams Avenue District was a designated mixed race neighborhood defined as census tracts 22 and 23, about a mile and a half long and a mile wide. It was marked, excuse me, with red lines on realtor maps. Minority habitation outside this area was prohibited by the Realtor's Code of Ethics, and the reason given was because the presence of racial minorities was expected to devalue nearby homes. Thus, the property rights of white people was legally enshrined in Portland City regulations as a higher priority than the right of black people to live here. Disregarding race in real estate transactions could result in fines, suspension of a realtor's license, or expulsion from the realty board. This covenant was eventually outlawed by the Federal Civil Rights Act of 1965. Next slide, please. During the Second World War, Portland's black population soared from the pre-war census figure of 2,000 to an estimated 25,000. Many blacks lived in Vanport, in fact, more than in the Williams Avenue district. In 1948, Vanport was destroyed by a Columbia River flood. Because of segregation, there was nowhere for the blacks to go. The Williams Avenue neighborhood was already full. More than half the blacks who moved to Portland during the war had to move away from Oregon by 1950. Next slide, please. This is the memorial in the park blocks downtown for all the Oregon soldiers who gave their lives during the World War II. There was considerable public support for a permanent memorial, and likewise, there was a public support for a proposed exposition and recreation center where conventions, concerts, and sports events could be held. Proposed locations were Delta Park, Selwood, Northwest, and the South Auditorium District, which is the one that the city government was tending to favor. However, East Side commercial clubs united to petition the city to consider the area between the steel and Broadway bridges. Next slide, please. Under construction at the time was the Lloyd Center, which would soon be the largest shopping center in the nation. The East Side pitch 
was to include the requirement that the siting of the exposition center would clear blighted areas. In 1955, the word blighted was code for black. The East Side Commercial Clubs wanted a white corridor connecting downtown to the Lloyd Center. After a sustained political campaign, plans were drawn up to demolish the entire core of the black neighborhood to make way for the Memorial Coliseum. That's the neighborhood. That's William Avenue, uh, Williams Avenue on the left going diagonally down. And that's the Broadway Bridge over on the right. Next slide, please. And there goes the neighborhood. After stripping away 476 houses and displacing thousands of people, as well as almost the entire commercial center of the black community, there are visible in this picture only a few social centers left standing such as T Tuxedo Junction, Frat Hall, the mysterious Billy Smith Tavern, but all of these would soon be leveled for I-5 freeway construction. And they, that took out another 125 houses. Other projects consumed all of the residences from the Willamette River to what is now Martin Luther King Boulevard. Let's go to the next slide, please. Now, I'd like to talk about Emanuel. The demolitions for the Coliseum, the freeway, and other projects forced the relocation of the black community further north. And the new commercial center became the area around Russell and Williams, which is um, on the extreme left in this Drawing. In 1962, the Portland Development Commission published the Central Albina Study, which found the Albina District to be a worthless slum and proposed clearance to prevent the spread of slums to adjacent neighborhoods. Actually, it wasn't a slum at all. It was very nice. But the PDC's solution was to bulldoze the neighborhood and build cement warehouses and parking lots to replace them. At this time, Emanuel Hospital was planning to enlarge their campus, and this is a drawing of the proposal. With Emanuel, the Portland Development Commission found the perfect partner to, again, eliminate the core of the black community. Next slide, please. That's Williams Avenue on the right of the proposed Emanuel campus. And Russell is down at the bottom. One of the most damning events to befall the black community in Portland was the proposed Emanuel expansion. Emanuel wanted to add 19 acres to their campus in a neighborhood that was home for 80% of Portland's black population. <laughs> The Portland Development Commission got a grant from the Federal Model Cities Program to make an urban renewal district for a manual that would take away about 10 blocks of homes and businesses for the hospital expansion. Next slide, please. The Model Cities Program required a citizens planning board from the community where the redevelopment was proposed. Originally, the Citizens Board had a black director, Alvin Batiste. In January of 1970, he was fired by Mayor Schrunk over a fight Batiste was having with the Portland Development Commission. The issue was that the PDC had loaded the Citizens Planning Board with people who were not from the community, but rather from the PDC itself. In other words, the PDC put their own members on their own advisory board, which, and I quote Batiste, 
would exert colonial rule over the committee. Mayor Schrunk simply hired a political operative to replace the fire director. But the black community strenuously objected to the clearance of the Albina neighborhood for Emanuel. And the meetings became so contentious that the next model city's meeting was closed to the public and the press. There, Mayor Schrunk stripped the committee of its voting power and made it an advisory committee. The PDC subsequently decided to do an end run around the model city's requirements and obtained an exemption from participating in it. This ended all of Portland's responsibility for involving their community in deciding their own fate. One month later, federal funding to acquire all the properties in the proposed district came through. Next slide, please. This is the corner of Williams and Russell. This was the heart of the black community's business district. Now you see it. Next slide. Now you don't. 209 houses. Nine square blocks. Over a thousand people displaced. Just as the bulldozers finished their work, word arrived that the funding for Emanuel's construction had failed the vote in Congress. All of this destruction was for nothing. Emanuel never used any of this land. The demolitions happened before the funding for the hospital was even close to reality. The political machine behind the dem demolitions was unstoppable. The PDC refused all further proposals from the community to use the land, even for parks. It is not an organic death that killed the Williams Avenue neighborhood and the jazz clubs. If anything, they were poised to create here in Portland a cultural renaissance of international note. All along, Portland's policies towards blacks was to squeeze them out of their neighborhoods and prevent them from moving into any other. The Williams Avenue District was intentionally poisoned by the Portland Development Commission, who was desperate to disperse the close-knit black community into the four winds. The city of Portland intentionally drove its black citizens away by condemning their homes and businesses and, pre and preventing them from moving anywhere else except some other state. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Michael Tete. I'm here um, uh, before you this evening, and I have an almost impossible task, which is to try and capture all of the progress that um, the city of Portland has made around the Williams Avenue corridor as it relates to transportation, while at the same time unearthing the complexity of issues that are presented when you're working in the right-of-way in a place that has a history that is as rich and as beautiful and as destructive and clearly as, des as disasterly as um, we just had an opportunity to hear from Mr. Robinson. Born and raised here in Portland, Oregon, and I'm a forester and fire ecologist by training. I currently lead the implementation of our Transportation Bureau's Fixing Our Streets program, which is a 10 cent carbon fuels tax that aims to deliver $74 million worth of infrastructure investments over the next four years all across the city of Portland. So if that seems like a little bit of um, a departure to go from forestry to um, carbon fuels tax, I guess you don't have to look any farther than the kind of conditions we see outside of our doors to know um, that the forests, um, if it weren't for our um, decisions here in the city, would probably be just fine. Um, but because of some of the things that we decide to prioritize in the urban environment, um, they're struggling. But enough about that. 
Um, I want to share a little bit of the history of the Williams Avenue bike um, lane and how the subsequent Williams Avenue um, Stakeholder Advisory Committee was founded. So, uh, in uh, 2010, the Portland Bureau of Transportation um, launched a Stakeholder Advisory Committee to inform the decision making around a multimodal safety project on North Williams Avenue. Just so that I can calibrate my remarks, who's familiar with that uh, transportation project? Can you raise your hand? Okay. Seems like we've got a little bit more of that education to do here this evening. So, um, and who's familiar with the current configuration of North Williams Avenue? Yep, okay. Okay, I have one more bit of uh, democracy here. How many people really like uh, the way that street's configured right now? Hello. <laughs> okay, just a couple of us then. Okay. So it was originally launched in February of uh, 2011, but by June of 2011, um, it was clear that the city of Portland did not have adequate representation or engagement from the surrounding neighborhood. And what I mean there is uh, adequate representation from the surrounding neighborhood. This isn't a case where they didn't take the time to just talk to the African American community. They didn't take the time to just uh, target uh, one specific group for outreach. I think at the time the Bureau of Transportation hadn't done all of the work that it needed to do to really authentically engage the entire neighborhood and if they had, they would have had an opportunity to hear from residents that had called North Williams um, and that corridor home for years and years. And it's at this point that I want to pause and really highlight the complexity of this issue. There's um, a CNN program from W. Kamau Bell uh, that's called uh, United States of America. Have people seen that? Now, keep your hands up if you've seen the one that they did for Portland. Okay, so Brother Kamau, when he's there, he's got to try to cover an issue as complex as this in about 45 minutes once you take out all the commercials, right? And ultimately, that conversation boils down to a relatively simple question, a question of victims and villains, right? These developers doing these uh, dastardly things and then these folks that are being displaced. I wanna encourage you as you go through your conversation this evening and you have your facilitated conversations, you try to embrace the complexity of the situation and put yourselves empathetically, if not sympathetically, into the shoes of the people who would really uh, desperately deserve an opportunity to engage in that kind of conversation. So if they were asking for more engagement and they were asking for their voices to be heard, just understand that it was their basic right and an expectation that they had. So how did that group change over time? Because by June of 2011, the Bureau of Transportation realized they needed to really change course or else they were gonna be in a situation where their project was not gonna be able to move forward. So the Bureau took unprecedented steps to pause the process and engage in a deeper conversation around the history and potential impacts of the proposed investments. That dialogue forced individuals and groups to grapple with the legacy of systemic racism, oppression, and bigotry. And as difficult as that was, it's only part of the story. We had an opportunity to hear about the legacy of community building, civic leadership, and economic independence, a legacy that lives on to this day. And when you get an opportunity to study the photos presented by my fellow panelists, and you consider the stories behind the artwork that we'll be hearing about later, understand that it is the necessary and inevitable outcome presented by black leadership. Sustained and authentic progress that was dashed time and time again by forces outside of the control of everyday residents. I'm gonna make sure to let the leaders of our art project share more about their artistic process, and their motivations. I'm gonna just cover the logistics around how that process came about. The Williams Avenue Stakeholder Advisory Committee recommended that the Portland Bureau of Transportation set aside money in order to honor the history of the black community in the area. A committee was formed in 2014 and that committee was made up of some of the SAC members and longtime neighborhood residents. The committee decided to have the Regional Arts Council, and I believe we have folks from the Regional Arts Council here uh, with us this evening, thank you. And that committee decided to have the RAC help with the request and the proposal process. The committee and the RAC hosted an, inform, an informational meeting to talk about the history of the safety project and the community dialogues around racism. There was a subcommittee that was formed to go through the proposals and interview final candidates. And in 2015, the subcommittee chose Cleo Davis and Kaylin Talton Davis to do the artwork. And we're so glad that they did. After many interviews and lots of research, Cleo and Kaylin created 30 signs and 10 tiles that were installed just this summer. A kiosk is still to go in, which will include stories and pictures from the area. 
Prior to the project going in, Portland Bureau of Transportation held an open house specifically for the black community to view the artwork and tell stories about growing up in the area. For those of us that were there, it was standing room only at uh, Billy Webb El Elks Lodge, um, and it was a really wonderful event. Right after the artwork was installed, the Bureau of Transportation and the Regional Arts Council held a celebration in Dawson Park that was open to all community members. So the future on um, North Williams Avenue, from um, uh, fixing our streets, Portland Bureau of Transportation standpoint, we're actually going to be performing um, paving and ADA ramp improvements from Stanton uh, to Cook Street. The expectations that we have of the Bureau of Transportation and the City of Portland around that corridor in the future is hopefully something that you all get an opportunity to discuss at your tables this evening. And you give me an opportunity here to talk about words of wisdom. I think the fact that you all are here and able to participate in this dialogue and confront this issue is a real gift, a great privilege. It is because of the gracious community leaders, some of those who are in the audience with us today, and many more who are not, that we're here today. There's no better place to consider the impacts of development, displacement, investment, and systemic oppression than this corridor, because it's so clearly, clearly on display. There's a lot more to do, but I want to make sure to thank our hosts for bringing us together this evening. I want to thank all the leaders who have contributed so much to make Portland a great place to live for all of us residents. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, to introduce myself, my name is Kayeen Talton Davis, and I am one of the artists that created the Black Williams, or Historic Black Williams Art Project. Um, in my function, I was the project manager. And just a little bit of background about myself and my husband, Cleo. We've been, we're Portland natives, and both grew up in inner north, northeast Portland. We have family members who grew up along the Williams Corridor. We spent many afternoons, days, weekends, a lot of time involved and invested in the community. And when we heard that there was a project that was going to go in to commemorate this community that was so much a part of our lives, not only as children, but as adults with a business on North Williams Avenue, we knew that it was something that we wanted to participate in. In that, we dug into stories, not only our own personal stories, but stories from the community, from those who we knew growing up, from those who we've, we've heard the stories of, from having things pointed out to us, from hearing about different events that were going on. We were able to sit down with family members of the community, not just our own, but family members of the community, our community elders, and go through photo albums and listen to the stories. Is that better? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. We were able to sit down and listen to stories that we really hadn't heard, but that people of generations previous to us had grown up with. We learned about the churches that are now long gone due to community development. We learned about businesses that were the place to be that are again long gone, excuse me, to community development. We heard stories from Vanport survivors about picking up their children and running to the car as the water was washing in. We heard a story from a woman who was one of the first female welders in the shipyards and it was awesome to be able to sit and learn about history from someone who lived it and also as part of this project we reached out to the youth we worked with high school students high school students who were at an alternative high school because they had their own issues with the community but what they learned is that their roots for many of them ran deeper than they thought they did. There was a young lady who had never really asked their, her grandmother about the history of her family. And she found out not only that her grandmother was there at Vanport and a Vanport survivor, 
but that some of the things we talked about, losing family possessions, heirlooms, your identification, your birth certificate, if you had one, all of those things were brought to her as being more than just somebody else telling another story. It became her own family history. And it's something that she cherishes to this day. We talked with those young adults about how economics plays such a large part in communities and in community development. How if you are a temporary worker, then your income is rather temporary. If you do not own the land that you're on, then it can be very easily taken away from you, especially when there are larger parties at play. And so this art project was more than just art to us. This art project is something that has been in our blood, in our brains, in our bodies. It is something that is from our hearts. And it's something that we wanted to bring for the, for, for the community. We wanted to make sure that those businesses, all, those, uh, all the economic strength that was lost by redevelopment, by urban planning, by all of these different code names for getting folks out, was returned to the community one way or another. And to that end, that is why we have not only artwork on the street, but that is why we also have the kiosk and have a website to where information about additional businesses, about additional artists that are within the black community can be found so that we can start to redevelop some of this economic strength and participate in the economics of what is now North Williams Avenue. There was nothing like sitting in our own shop and stepping outside to take a breath of fresh air and have people look at you or people look at us like we didn't belong there when we'd been there for about five, ten years. At that, personally, five to ten years at that point. But it, yeah, it had been in the family for much longer. So having that feeling of growing up in an area, living in that area, and having the vast majority of people coming in acting like you don't belong in that area can be quite crushing. And it's very hard to deal with. It's very hard to be able to um, move forward from that. But we had to. And what came out of that is this art project. We didn't come in as people who just wanted to come in, put some art on the street, and move on. We wanted to make sure that the art reflected our community. We wanted to make sure that it was something that showed the strength of our community, that it wasn't just the stories of a blighted neighborhood, which is such a, I want to say alternative fact. <laughs> but we wanted to make sure that the artwork was something that we could be proud of, that the art families could be proud of, that our extended families, that our community, that the black community of Portland could be proud of, and to feel like it was something that belonged to them, as opposed to something that just went up, that they didn't participate in, and that was just another thing that those folks did in an area that we don't even live in anymore. Thank you. My name is uh, Cleo Davis. Um, that's a tough one to follow. <laughs> Kayeen pretty much said it all. Um, I feel like we uh, really worked hard to get this project, just like my wife said, to um, make sure it wasn't just art on the street, to make sure that not only that there was a true representation, but that we could move into the future. So for me, myself, this is about moving into the future, economic development, looking at what, how we built this 
in, in such a system that was against us for, for so many, for so long and in so many facets. It's, it's uh, very, it's so much that went into this. Uh, it, it was so much research. When, when you're interviewing folks and they talk about everything that they've lost and they begin to cry and, and they tell you um, all the, the great memories and the stories, that's, that's, that's tough. That's very hard to combine all of this information together and then put it, put it out there. But we were able to do that. Our original, one of our intents was to, excuse me, hold on. One of our original intents was, again, to make sure that the black community participated in the economics of North Williams. Um, initially, we thought of doing that as a vending machine, which is something we may circle back to one way or another. But something that could be on the street, be permanent, and be a way to reach out. We are obviously not the only black artists here in Portland. We are not the only black business owners. There are a lot. There are some that I see here, and I hope that you do support them in their businesses. We wanted to make sure that with Portland, which is now a hot spot around the world for people to come and live and visit and participate and be tourists, that the people who put a lot of energy, a lot of growth energy into North Williams and the surrounding area, the people who grew up there and built lives there are able to participate and not be, though they have might have been priced out and pushed out from owning and having a home ownership there, that they are able to still participate in the community in which they grew up in the community which was initially created for them. Okay. So, so basically, let me say this. With doing this project and collecting all the ar ar archivable information, it really got to me. It really made me understand how much of a trick bag that the black community and others are in when it comes to this system. We, and I'm assuming that all the individuals here who come to a program called Race Talks is to talk about race, ethnicity, all these things, and how we can live inclusively and sustainably, and all these so-and-so buzzwords. But the truth of the matter is, this is a social construct that came out of the minds of some that feed on the many. The few feed on the many. So, basically what I'm saying is, we need, to, we need to change this social construct. Art alone is not gonna do it, but it will start the conversation. We need to look at economics, we need to look at these buzzwords called um, blight and, and, and urban renewal, and all these processes that, are, that tend to move people out. Gentrification, you know, 
a, a, lot of, a lot of people in my community get upset with this term gentrification. And it's, it's, a, it's a word trick because gentrification means the gentry. The gentry are the noble class who come in and move the lower class out. And I'm hearing about all kind of crazy stuff from black gentrification, all, the, all this stuff. So if it was black gentrification in a black neighborhood, we would not be complaining. So when you have others say that, oh, well, we've been gentrified too. Well, when other cultures so-called gentrify a neighborhood, it destroys the culture, not, the, not only the economics of an area. It destroys the culture when you disperse people, when you harm people. A change needs to come. And that change, that change takes vision and imagination. Throughout this process, I've heard many people say, well, that's not realistic. On all these policies and all these changes, that's not realistic. Well, what is reality? Do we not shape our own realities? Does not reality come out of the mind, come out of the imagination? The building that we're sitting in come, came out of imagination and was drafted up and people agreed upon it. So when you look at the history, I'm gonna go a little bit into the history of the uniqueness about the history of Oregon. Oregon was a state that vouched out of slavery, but in that vouching out of slavery, they also decided we don't want black people here. So we, we, don't, we just don't want that problem. And through that, as black people start coming as servants from, from around the, from around the uh, country with, with other traveling whites, you know, you have your famous sundown laws on so many lashes if you don't get up get out of town after, you know, the sundown and all that. <clears throat> but what was very unique that history doesn't show that we have researched and have uh, been able to see in all of these archives around the state is that this black community here was very unique unto any other in the United States. It was very successful. It was very progressive. Because this state had a, it, it, was, it, it never went through a Jim Crow process, but it went through more of an apartheid process with those laws. And the black community was in pockets, Northwest, North Portland, um, and Southeast. Those were the main pockets. And people came together. All, all of those communities, it wasn't about geography so much. It was about coming together. And those laws kind of, even though you kept your head down, we were very successful kind of like a Black Wall Street here, like in Tulsa, Oklahoma, if anyone's familiar with Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So there were black people all the way in 1850s with saloons and things of that nature. So I say, I kind of say all of that history to say, if you look at how a place starts and how it begins, you can see the policies and how people play out. And we are just willing participants in this play, in these policies. So I say use, use imagination and, and stick up and stand up and, and, and fight for this. Fight, fight for a change. If we're all here talking about race talks and change and things of that nature. Don't, don't just go with the status quo. That's what upsets me. 
that's what I've learned about this project, other than the, the personal stories that I've learned. But there's a, there's a bigger message here, and there's a way to do this. I mean, think about it. If you think about how many people in this country's constitutional rights are violated, well, we didn't all sit down and write the Constitution. This came out of somebody else's mind. If you look, then you take that on a, on a, on a, on a micro scale, from a macro to a micro, and you look at, well, who was PDC, now Portland Prosper, writing about blight? That wasn't us who sat at the table and decided to do these things. And inclusion, I mean, what, what do you include it into? All the corporate jobs, not all, but majority of the corporate jobs that I worked and had inclusion, what am I included into? Destroying my own community? Because I have to pay my mortgage and things of that nature? But this is, this is what this art project is to get the conversation going, as well as rebuilding the black community. And rebuilding communities that have been torn down. Um, that's the end of my time, I guess. I heard a buzzer. <laughs> Two more minutes. Two more? Uh, any questions? Uh. I think you can hear the emotion in people's voices and see it on them. And I was recently at a training where Teresa Rayford was speaking about what had happened to her family and to friends who had been killed. And it was so amazing to me because the people who were there at that, where she spoke, wanted to do a Q&A. And she couldn't do it. And they didn't quite understand why. And I, I won't tell you what I thought. I won't tell you what I thought. But what the problem is that this is not a speech that these people are giving. I was not emotional because I read a script and it said, now is the time to get emotional and tear up. There are some feelings here. And when I hear that they're going to do a tribute to the black community, that's kind of like saying, oh, we're going to show that the woolly mammoth was on these lands. And it's a museum, and there's a stuffed woolly mammoth, because there most certainly ain't no black folks here anymore for this tribute. And so we've been told that 600 housing units are going to be for low income. How, how many black folks are going to be in those income, those low income housing units? What they didn't tell you is that those houses were not, I thought Tom was going to show some of the houses. He, he didn't show the houses. What he showed was powerful. But the houses weren't blighted. I go for a walk. I'm part of a, of, of a walking group that's part of OHSU, a memory group. My sister is part of it, as is, um, where are you, Dorothy was in, a part of it too. And we go through the neighborhood that neighborhood didn't look like the one I grew up in. People's houses were clean. There weren't old couches sitting on people's porches. There weren't trees growing over. People's yards weren't dirty. The sidewalk didn't have mashed up seeds and stuff. I had to get out last night in front of my house and scrape with a shovel cherries from my neighbor's tree. It wasn't that kind of neighborhood. So when you hear that it was a blighted community, that's a lie. That's a lie. And the question is, when does the lie quit? Because I keep telling folks at Race Talks, you know that poem about first they came for the Jehovah's Witnesses, and then they came for the Jews, but I wasn't a Jew, so I didn't worry about it. And they came for the tradesmen, but I wasn't a tradesman, so I didn't worry about it. 
and it keeps going and it keeps going and it keeps going and then they came for me and there was nobody to save me. You're next. This is not an idle threat. You're next. So think about this. I try to get people here to talk, to get to know each other, to get to understand the past. There are some treacherous things out here in this world. I had a friend whose father was dying. They lived on Williams Avenue. They just happened to go to the hospital as a developer was in there trying to get him to sign his house away on his deathbed. I've heard that story more than one time. I've heard about people whose parents had paid for 30 years for a house and thought they owned the house come to find out they were paying an interest only loan. These are the kind of stories that go on and on and on. And they are no respecter of people. You are not safe. You are not safe. So I would like to ask people to be sure to go and see the markers along Williams Avenue. On your table is a special map that your tax dollars paid for, so please take, make sure you use them. And um, here on this are, is the, um, are the markers that are on Williams Avenue. I like to say start on Broadway and it goes all the way up to Killingsworth. And as you walk up the street, there are, you can see that they're on both sides of the street and there's history. There are 30 poles that were put into the ground with people's stories on them. And 10 of them have additional information with, um, with tiles, four, uh, four tiles that give additional information about that person. My father happens to be one of those people. And his story is pretty typical. Black guy came from the South, educated. Tom talked about the porters who were at Union Station. Many of those men had college degrees, master's degrees, but they couldn't get jobs, so they were porters. They carried somebody's luggage. They worked on the railroad. My father had been a teacher in the South, but they were afraid to hire him. He weighed 10 pounds more than I do now and was six feet tall, and they were afraid that he would, um, they were afraid for the safety of young white girls, so he didn't get a teaching job. So he became a barber and made a living. So there are all kinds of story. Cleo quit talking, not because he didn't have anything to say, but because he got too emotional to finish his story. There is a lot of blood and sweat and tears behind that Williams Avenue construction. And I like to say these people are not wealthy landowners. They're white people who have a bank loan I can't get. And I want you to understand how unfair that is. My parents owned a business for over 40 years off of Williams Avenue. They decided to get rid of their grocery store, which they had gotten, and to get a liquor store because they would have less overhead and hassle. They got the worst liquor store in the state of Oregon, which made the least revenue, was in the worst location, and they had to put up a $100,000 bond of their own money. At the same time, a young man who was 27, whose father had owned, who had been a liquor um, license, worked for the Liquor Commission. He got one of the nicer ones in the state that was profitable, and he put up no bond. Zip, zap, zup. And what did he do to prove that he was capable of taking care of that? He was white, and his father had owned a business. Now, I don't know which is more proof of, that you can run a business than somebody who has run one for over 40 years or somebody who has someone who ran one in their family. And even with all of that, there were things that the Liquor Commission 
did not tell my parents about that because they became friends with some of the other um, commissioners, with some of the other people who had liquor stores, they found out about how to run the business because the liquor commission wasn't honest and didn't tell them all the ins and outs of what they needed to do. So there's a lot behind all of this. So when I hear we want to have a tribute to the black community, I ain't going to tell you what I think because it's not pretty. And every time we walk through the community, I'm triggered. I'm triggered by seeing here's a house that somebody used to have that was well kept that's not kept well anymore. And I'm sorry the gentry are not taking care of these houses. So I'm going to calm down now. I want you to take your map with you when you leave. Please do the walk. And we have questions on the evaluations. There's an evaluation here. Please make sure you fill it out before you go. On the back side of the evaluation in yellow are some questions, some thought questions. You don't have to answer all those questions. Pick one, pick some that you'd like to answer. We have here, um, how, how many people are trained facilitators? Raise your hand. So, could you, okay, Shana, you're at that table. Malcolm, could you move to this table? Galena's here. Galena, will you be a facilitator? Thank you for doing that. And um, what I would like for you to do is someone decide at your table who will be the facilitator. There are directions on the back here how to facilitate your own conversation. And right now, what time is it? Eight o'clock. I'll come back at nine o'clock. So go ahead and talk. I would like to encourage our speakers uh, to go sit at one of the tables so that you can be um, to talk about it. And if before you leave, please make sure if you're going to leave now, please make sure that you um, fill out an evaluation. I will tell you, if you leave now, you're about to miss the best part of the evening. So thank you very much, and I'll be back at 9 o'clock. We're going to, um, before you leave, don't go anywhere, um, please make sure you fill out your evaluation. Uh, Miss Tanisha, don't make me call you out. Don't make me call you out. Sit down. Sit down. I see you. I see you. Yes, I'm calling you out. We haven't done the drawing yet. It's, it's hard getting good help. It's hard having good participants. You know you got to call people out to sit down. I tell you. Even if you love them. Okay, so um, we have a video that we're going to show you, and this part of the program, we have a special uh, drawing. You remember I asked you, do you know your neighbors? So, do you remember that? Yes. <laughs> this is a participatory audience kind of thing here. Okay, so Carlos is going to start the video, and it's going to tell us how you pick someone to do this. Okay. I think we're going to do that. So while we're waiting for this, I want to say to you, here's a, here's a, a flyer. This is just a suggestion. Someone passed this out. It's called White People, What Can White People Do to Destroy White Power? And I appreciate that there are people who are working to stop inequity, inequity but I would not have aimed it like this. What, we don't want to destroy what white people have. What we want is to have equity. And it's not about being against something, it's about being for something. Do you understand the difference? Yeah. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? There's a difference. So, please, I don't want you to come and tell me how to get rid of me. So why would I want to find out how to get rid of you? We want, to, we want to have things be equitable. And when you're putting stuff together, think about that. Think about that. And I know it's white people doing it, but I'm just still telling you. 
It's an attitude. You want to be pro instead of anti. So are we ready? We're not going to do it. I'm not going to say the words that I'm thinking. Okay, so here's how this works. Carlos is going to pick up with me. All right. You know how people are always saying I would give you my card except I don't have one? Yeah. You do. This is the card. This is a business card, except there ain't nothing on it. So what you're going to do is you're going to eyeball somebody at your table or across the room and say, gee, I think I'd like to get to know that person better. And what you're going to do is write your name and email address and phone number on this card. And I picked a cute young guy. And he's going to write his name and email and phone number on there. And then we are going to exchange cards. Now here's the juicy part. Where's the other one? So now we take a third one, which is a different color. I don't know if you can tell this is a different color. And we write Donna and Carlos, Carlos on this paper. And then we're going to put it in the basket. Is the basket back there, Tony? Can you hold up the basket? We're coming for you in a little bit. Shana sees it. So we're going to write the... Oh, Tanisha just sent me a message. Uh -uh. <laughs> <laughs> Tell her she ain't slick. So we're going to write our name on it and then put it in the basket. And then there's a drawing. And then McMinimins has come up with a $25 gift certificate for two people to go to any Mc, uh, McMinimins, almost said McDonald's, McMinimins, <laughs> and get to know each other. Oh. Now, the whole idea is don't talk about race. Just get to know each other. Talk about stuff that makes sense, like what's your name, how many kids you got, what do you like to do. Yeah. Get to know each other so that you can start learning what it feels like to get to know people. And, and, and that's all we want. So you got five minutes. Five minutes. And then we're going to come back and do the drawing. So talk to the people at your table. Thank you. Oh, and I forgot. Silly me. I don't get paid for this. We're writing grants right now, and we need money. So please put some money in this envelope. At your table is a purse, a little purse. Put some money in there. How much was this evening worth in terms of information to you? How much was it in terms of changing your life? $5, $20, $100? Put money in the, in the uh, purse because we have to pay our speakers for it tonight. So I will be back in five minutes. All right? Thank you. Shana, hold up the basket so they can see. Shana. Shana, Shana, hold up the basket. Shana is walking around. The pretty lady is walking around with the basket. Put your name in there. And I have three people who I would like to come up and kind of draw one out. So Liliana and um, Ife and Chingwe, I want you three to come up, Shana has it, I want you three to come up and draw and then from that I will take one of those. Come on, Chingwe, you're not going to come up here? Okay, don't come. Is she crying? It's okay. Oh, hey, really? Hey. All right. Going, going. Sh Shana's coming up to the front. She's on her way. Uh, 
All right. So, oh, we've got a big basket full. I want to see if you folks know how to follow directions because one night, you're not going to believe this, we had a drawing and I had to draw nine times to find a slip that had two people's names on it because everybody gave me their, their name and, and their email address. All right, so, all right, so you pick one. Take one out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. So, which one do you want? You take one, and then I'll keep one. Which one do you want? Which one do you want? Hey, we got a system up here. All right. The winners tonight are Brazil and Melissa. your card. Where are you? Oh, no. I'm sorry. Those people didn't win. Those were the ones who were picked not to win. We won't tell who they are. So, here you go. Let's hear it for Brazil and Melissa. Thank you. Okay, so, uh, please fill out your evaluation form. And please put a lot of money into that envelope so we can pay our speakers and so we can do more planning for race talks. Also, next month, we'd like to invite you to come back. And I'm not sure what our topic is going to be. It might be women of color in the workplace. I have put out there, you know, we have a new police chief. Um, I put out that maybe we'd like to meet the new police chief. So I'm working on that. So depending on what comes up, it's a merry mix-up. So thank you so much for coming. We appreciate you being here. We know this is not an easy thing to do, to talk about difficult topics. Please make sure you fill out your evaluations, and we'll see you next month. Take the brochures with you and give them to your friends. Thanks a lot.